Without further ado, let's get underway. Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Accessory Dwelling Units in 2021, better known as ADUs. This webinar is brought to you by North San Diego County Realtors. My name is Peter Belain and I'm a realtor with ERA Ranch and C. I was the 2019 Realtor of the Year and currently sit on the Board of Directors for North San Diego County Realtors. And it's my pleasure to moderate today's webinar on ADUs. We have three speakers for you and each are experts in their field and hopefully we'll get to answer all of your questions today. Today's speakers are John Aronson, founder and CEO of Crest Backyard Homes. His company pr provides factory built and ground up accessory dwelling units. His company builds, sells, installs, and consults on construction projects throughout San Diego County. Our second speaker is Vanessa K Pash, land use and environmental planner, County of San Diego, planning and development services. Born and raised in San Diego and gradu graduated from SDSU, she has been a planner for the County of San Diego for eight years and works on residential and commercial development. Our third and final speaker is Cheryl Sutcliffe. Cheryl has been specializing in construction lending as well as other types of loans and properties at Prime Lending for the past four years. By assisting those looking to build their primary residence or add an ADU to their property, Sutcliffe gives honest feedback to help the borrower make a good decision as to their investment. With over 35 years experience in real estate and mortgage lending, Sutcliffe brings the tenure of the industry and assists home buyers and homeowners purchase, refinance, renovate, or construct the home of their dreams. Some of the topics that we will cover today are ADUs within the unincorporated parts of County of San Diego regarding setbacks, parking, junior ADUs, conversions and additions, financing ADUs, ADUs appraised value, a brief review of local and city ADU ordinance, how some jurisdictions are not yet in total compliance with state laws, utility installation, basic difference between HUD manufactured, modular, park model, tiny homes, and so much more. If you have any questions during the course of this webinar, webinar, please be sure to type them into the chat box and I will follow up after each presenter and get your questions answered. There will also be another opportunity at the end of the speakers for additional questions. Okay, enough preamble. Let's get started with our first speaker, John Aronson. John? Good afternoon, or I should say good morning, everybody. Hang on, I'm trying to share my screen. Here we go. Let me get uh, somebody, that little bar's in the way and I can't play. Okay, here we go, see if I can do that. Everybody hear me? I can hear you just fine. Okay, I'm just, uh, the, the little bar up on top is in the way and I can't hit my play button to start my presentation. I wanted to get rid of all the little uh, notes on the side. Try Ooh. dragging that, the bar. the bar. You can just click and drag it. You can click and drag, oh, okay, got it. Yeah, that makes it simple. Oh, you pros. Okay, there we go. Oh, and then this guy too is gonna to get in my way. So how do you, isn't there a way to make that go? Uh, there we go, perfect, okay. All right, uh, again, my name is John Aronson. I'm also a proud member of this uh, fantastic board. I've been a realtor uh, since 2007. And I'm happy to be here this morning. Uh, let's get the show on the road. Whoops, now why isn't it letting me advance? This is kind of weird. Not, uh, there we go. All right, oh, now that's in the way again. Boy, I've, I've got to get got to get set up here so things aren't. Uh, how do I get that out? Let me just get that out of the way. I don't need to see everybody. Okay, there we go. Off to that. Well, <laughs> all right, guys. This is all right. There's a lot. Okay, let me get it going here as good as I can. All right, we get uh, you know inquiries almost on a daily basis about what is and what isn't a, uh, an ADU. And uh, there's a lot of uh, different opinions. There's a lot of different facts uh, that we have to be uh, basically concerning ourselves with. And um, 
one, what isn't uh, a, a, an ADU legally is, is what you see here on the screen. And I don't think anybody's gonna have any problems uh, discerning what a recreation vehicle is, but they come in a variety of ways. There's a, a travel trailer, there's a, a, a motor home, uh, then there's a tent trailer, and there's even a fifth wheeler, but uh, none of these are really legally what they consider an, an accessory dwelling unit. They cannot be allowed in your backyard as a permanent installation. Now, there's a lot of areas throughout the county that uh, will allow you to park your mobile homes or your, your uh, not your mobile homes, but your recreation vehicles on the side of your uh, yard or on, on your, in your driveway or in your backyard, but they're not legally allowed to be lived in permanently. They're just uh, allowed to be stored essentially. But what is allowed, and this is working get kind of confusing, uh, is a park model or what they call a tiny home on wheels. And both are considered recreation vehicles and therein comes the rub. So these are considered recreation vehicles. They're under the ANSI code. Uh, why aren't the others allowed? These comply with certain building regulations and thus are considered and allowed and accepted in some jurisdictions. Now, San Diego, uh, the city of San Diego is actually the first city that has come to allow these. Um, there, I think there's going to be other uh, jurisdictions in, in San Diego that, that will allow them. I've been hearing the drums beating in the distance. I don't have any verification of it, but I do uh, understand that there are other jurisdictions that will be allowing uh, tiny homes on wheels and park models as, as an ADU. Okay, so this is the code. Basically, uh, this is an information bulletin. It was uh, written by the uh, city of San Diego. This governs their tiny home on wheel and park model ordinance. So I would recommend that everybody take a picture of this or at least uh, write down, copy these links and then refer to them. I don't wanna get into the weeds with them because it's pretty involved and detailed and I only have a few minutes to deliver my presentations. But for your own benefit, if you're interested in understanding more, about these, this, this new uh, ordinance, by all means, uh, copy this, uh, this page down, it's important. Okay, so a lot of folks uh, basically uh, need to be careful when they're, when they're buying what they think is a manufactured home, because there is a discernible difference. Uh, I know these photos don't look that different, but uh, they are. Uh, let me give you a little understanding of this. The park model bylaws has to be under 400 square feet, it's regulated by the Department of Motor Vehicles. And it's got basically the wheels and the axles cannot be removed, but the tongue can be removed and stored under the home. Uh, it cannot be placed on a permanent foundation and it's considered chattel, not real property. And before you get too far down the road, even in the cities that are allowing these, you need to talk to your lender to find out what is and what isn't going to be a value added to your real estate investment. Now, a manufactured home, by contrast, it has to be over 400 square feet. It is regulated by the Department of, or by the Housing and Community Development Department, also known as the HCD. Unlike the park model, they have the wheels and the axles and the tongue have to be removed, and it must be placed on a permanent HUD approved foundation system for a manufactured home. And it can be, and is, if done the right way, and Cheryl will be telling you more about this when she gets into her presentation, uh, if it's installed properly. But again, always check with your realtor. Another reason that you need to, you know, really understand the difference of, uh, always check for the HUD label. Uh, there's a, usually on the lower left-hand end of any unit, you're gonna see a HUD plate. Uh, sometimes they're painted over, Sometimes they're removed and there shouldn't be, but they are. And sometimes they're just sided over. So people add the aluminum siding or, uh, or, I mean, take away the aluminum siding, add the, uh, you know, the, the more modern uh, uh, vertical type of wood, wood uh, simulated wood or cementitious material known as hardy board uh, as, as, a, as a replacement for the, the old style aluminum siding. Okay, now, I'm going to take you to the wobbly box in here for a moment. 
Uh, and there is a difference between a house trailer, uh, also known as a coach or a mobile home and a HUD manufactured home. And this selection of finely crafted wobbly boxes as they're so affectionately referred to by the old schoolers or, or days gone by, uh, from as early as the 20s up until June 15th, 1976, they were labeled in a variety of ways, anything counted from a trailer to, to a house trailer, to a coach, to a mobile home, was fair game. Prior to 1976 or June, June 15th, 1976, the entire industry, all, everything, including mobile homes, was regulated by the Department of Motor Vehicles. Since June 15th, 1976, what was once the mobile home industry was renamed officially, and that is a key word, it's officially considered the manufactured home industry. It's no longer considered the mobile home industry. You still get a lot of folks referring to it as mobile homes or trailers or coaches, but since June 15th, 1976, any home built subsequently is a manufactured home. They're built differently too, to a much higher standard. They're built just like houses are. I've been to many factories. You can't tell the difference. I am a general contractor and a manufactured home contractor, and you cannot discern the difference between the two. Okay, in the early days, this was the rule and not the exception. Folks would pack up the car, the kiddies and the camping gear and hook the 13 footer up to the bumper. As, we, as some of us recall, maybe not all you folks remember those days, but I certainly do. And then they'd go off on their little travel adventure. This is not an approved ADU. This cannot be used, even though it's an ANSI approved trailer, it is not approved for permanent uh, habitation. Uh, okay, I'll see, again, back in the old days, uh, in, in, let's say circa 50s, and this is, whoops, I gotta go back. This is very near and dear to me. Um, this little trailer park, basically, uh, you, a lot of things evolved. A lot of folks no longer wanted to hook their trailer up to their trailer hitch again and just travel. They wanted, they found a little place they liked and they wanted to stay there, and make a home out of it, like a second vacation home. Now, this little place, El Moro Cove in Laguna Beach, uh, this is where I got my start. Uh, our family owned a place here for 55 years, almost four generations until it was acquired by the state and, and converted into a state park. And uh, I brought my, my kids and even some of my grandkids up living in this little trailer and we had it for a vacation home. So all of my children knew a lot about tiny living at a very early age in their lives. Then I'm sure you folks uh, don't remember this, uh, Desi and Lucy Arnez, uh, they had a, a little trailer that they prided themselves on. It was called the New Moon. This was the exact trailer that uh, my family and I lived in in this little beach community. And uh, as you can see, a lot of folks uh, became kind of stationary. Uh, and they they kind of like the idea of ha hanging out in one spot. And you kind of notice this you know, little subtle uh, nuances like the skirting, white picket fences. And these were all basically, uh, you know, there to kind of make it feel more like a, a second home, give it more of a, a, a charm and an ambiance of uh, permanence, if you will. Now, circa 60s, mid 70s, had a new revolution. By the early 60s, it was a whole new ball game. The mobile home industry was born, ushering in the 10 and 12 foot wide by 64 foot length, single wide mobile home, soon to be followed by the double wides. And that's where the stigma came, the double wide. They've written songs about it. They've had movies about it. But uh, the old days are long gone. The new manufactured homes today, are they don't look like that any longer. They're not built like that any longer. Just to give you an example, these old aluminum trailers were built with very thin gauged aluminum siding, two by three to two by four exterior walls, and two by two to two by three interior walls with three sixteenths inch paneling on the inside. They weighed about 10,000 pounds. Today's manufactured home, by contrast, is built with heavy duty, hardy uh, siding on the exterior, fully, fully uh, two by four, two by six exterior walls, or uh, um, studs, I should say, framing, and then uh, drywall interiors. And they weigh about 20,000, 20 to 25,000 pounds. So there is a discernible difference between the way these are built today. Okay, now my parents were living proof of, uh, of just how these 
little manufactured home or mobile home communities evolved, they kept their little single white in a quaint little spa in the, in the desert. My dad bought his truck and a fifth wheeler, and my mom and dad just toured the entire Western Hemisphere for over a decade before they finally uh, returned uh, to their little park to live out the rest of their lives. Uh, just a little trivia, give a little perspective. Back in the day, in the 60s, you could buy a double wide for $10,000, install it for about $1,000, and pay about $100 a month for your park space. So that in, in, in that particular genre uh, was, was a new paradigm shift for downsizing, a little bit different than the kind of downsizing we're experiencing today by putting these uh, ADUs in people's backyards. So now they've changed, things have changed big time. Uh, something happened on July 15th, 1976, as I mentioned, a whole new industry emerged. The HUD manufactured home entered the arena with, uh, when HUD decided to get into the game, building uh, quality standards changed. Uh, no longer were the little wobbly boxes of yesteryear. Uh, it was a whole new ball game. Within a few short years, manufactured homes were the new benchmark for affordable housing solutions and actually still are today uh, by federal housing standards. In the early 80s, the innovation and uh, land use emerged and all these little developments started popping up all over the countryside. A lot of you folks from North County may recognize this little park on the bottom right-hand corner. It's a little retirement community in San Marcos called Las Brisas. And just so you know, those were manufactured homes and they were stucco sided and they came with tiled roofs. And yes, you can, if you're interested, uh, you can, if your HOA requires that you mimic the architectural motif of the primary residence, you can do that. You can get these homes delivered stucco ready and tile roof ready. You don't do that in the factory. You wouldn't want to take delivery of one that traveled 55 miles an hour down the freeway uh, and see the kind of cracks and breakage that you'd have to deal with. So these are done uh, aftermarket on site. Okay, now, can you tell the difference? In the upper left is the HUD manufactured home. The bottom right is a modular home. There's not much difference in the way they're built. Generally, it's difficult to discern between the two. Uh, however, there will be, uh, the, what, the difference will really impact your pocketbook, essentially. Uh, the main difference is that a HUD code supersedes all local jurisdictions, whereas the modular option must comply with local jurisdictions, and therefore it takes more time for required inspections, permitting, and just miscellaneous red tape and bureaucracy. It also requires a load-bearing perimeter wall, uh, interior footings, and that can dramatically impact the price. Uh, by contrast, a manufactured home uh, doesn't require a stem wall foundation. Instead, this is a stem wall foundation on the upper left-hand uh, corner here in this photo, and a modular home is placed, as you can see in the photo on the right, on that foundation. You can also see underneath the home, there's no mainframe steel chassis, which you see in the bottom left-hand corner with, a, with its brother, the, the manufactured component, there's a steel mainframe chassis, which is then set on a series of steel piers on a compacted, uh, what they call, uh, it's a soil, it's, it's a, uh, a road base that comprised of an aggregate uh, of um, uh, chopped up, if you will, concrete and, and uh, asphalt. It's like sticking a bunch of chunks of concrete and asphalt in a big blender and then out comes this road base that's compacted 95%. So these are structurally very sound. And then after the, the initial setup, the uh, photo to the right shows the foundation components that are then tied to the frame of the manufactured home and unitized to the ground. And this is what constitutes the permanency or what they call the foundation system for a manufactured home. And Cheryl will get into more of that in, in her spiel uh, regarding how they're deemed a, a real structure, uh, how a manufactured home can actually become a real structure to real estate. Okay, with a little creative imagination and some ingenuity, you can turn a little one bedroom, one bath, 500 square foot single wide manufactured home into a beautiful and spacious three bedroom, two bath uh, luxury uh, home. You can actually make this into a duplex if you wanted to, but this was a little three and two 
down close to the beach in, in Encinitas. Okay, now the reason we're all here, and what we wanna find out is what the costs are. Uh, we start with a custom ground up design build. Uh, you can expect to pay north of $400 a square foot in San Diego for, for something custom like that. You can pay as much as $1,000 a square foot. My daughter's an interior designer. She works with, with high-end clients and uh, they want what they want and they're, they're, they're willing to pay for it. These, these things can get crazy expensive if you, if you, if you want to spend the money. Uh, some cities, uh, in, in, including the county of San Diego, actually have what they call pre-planned approved uh, drawings that you can actually get and some of them are free. And it also waives the permit fees. So there is a considerable savings there. But the caveat, don't change the floor plan. Because the minute you do that, it has to go back to engineering, back to plan check. And then you might as well get it at the end of the line because now you're submitting essentially a new set of plans and a whole new set of dynamics uh, basically can emerge at that point. And to your right, you have the HUD manufacturer. Oh, the price per square foot on the uh, pre plan proofs are start as low as about $275 a square foot. We've done them. Uh, there's not a whole lot of difference uh, in, in, in the, the methodology and in, in the construction protocol. So you're not going to save a whole lot of money, but uh, you can save a little bit. By contrast, the HUD manufactured home placed on the manufactured engineered approved foundation system is about $200 a square foot and up. But do know the little yellow caveat at the bottom, the note, uh, the cost for permits, site development, your grading, your excavation, your engineering, your utilities, retainer walls, septic systems, all these things are site specific and can really impact the overall cost of your ADU project. So it's important that you work with a team or a company that knows all these little nuances and isn't going to come back to you later with a bunch of change orders and say, oh, by the way, I didn't realize this, but, and you'll hear that a hundred times uh, in, in a lot of instances, unless you really are very careful about selecting the team and understand that they have an understanding of the entire protocol from beginning to end. Again, this little three bedroom, two bathroom out, they make great little uh, rentals. Uh, you, they're long-term rental, a lot, if they get close to the coast where it's permitted, a lot of them are going to short-term rentals, but you can get upwards of $4,000 a month for them. Or another application, just put it in your backyard, uh, use it as a little granny flat for which they're primarily intended. You can house an aging parent. Uh, you can, you can uh, offer it to a, a caregiver to live in to, so they can be close to an aging parent. Uh, you can have one of your children or going to college or maybe a newlywed uh, live in there for a while. Use it as a, a kind of a starting point uh, on their journey to the home ownership. Uh, again, uh, depending on your, uh, your architectural motif and your requirements, you might get uh, into some pretty uh, snazzy architectural motifs. And you also might have to comply with HOAs. Even though they're not prohibited any longer, you're under the new Senate bill that went out uh, that started in, in January of 2020, actually, you can no longer, uh, HOA can no longer uh, uh, not allow an ADU to be built. However, they can designate and they can regulate the style and the type and the architectural motif of the structure that goes on the property. In many instances, like this little Victorian here, the folks that owned the larger home wanted this to look like that larger home. Uh, and you can really get into some high-end stuff. Uh, you, these are modulars. Uh, this whole project was done with modular housing and design, uh, but it, 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 it was very expensive. Ended up costing about $800 a square foot. But that little structure in the back is the little one-bedroom studio ADU. Okay, lastly, I'd like to introduce my friend Cole Peterson and Cole and his team are gonna be delivering a professional training and accreditation program for ADUs. They're right now offering it in the uh, North, Northern uh, California in the Bay Area, in Seattle, Washington, Portland, Oregon, and now even Hawaii. And basically uh, they, their program will uh, give realtors that wanna take the four hour class uh, 
kind of an exclusive designation as ADU experts. And that, ladies and gentlemen, ends my little spiel. Uh, look forward to any questions at the end of the session. Thank you for indulging me. Have a good day. Thanks, John. Uh, before you sign off completely, um, I'm wondering if you can put up a slide with your contact information. There's been some requests in the chat box that each uh, presenter give their info so people can follow up with you later if they have questions. That'd be great. Let me dig through my archives a bit and you can go ahead with your program. And as soon as I find one, I'll, I'll circle back. Okay. I've got plenty. I just have to pull one up. I don't want to delay the game. So please go ahead and stop the screen share. All righty. Let me get my cursor over it. Anybody ever have a difficult time finding their cursor? Um, boy, this is crazy. I can't, it's not showing up for some reason. I'm trying. Where is my cursor? Come on. So while John's uh, looking for his cursor here, um, there's, there's this a little uh, chat uh, discussion, which I think the whole, uh, everyone can benefit from here, asking about a property being reassessed for ADUs. In this case, um, They've lived in their house a long time, so their assessments are low and they're concerned about putting an ADU and having the whole property reassessed to current value. And uh, so that's uh, a perfect segue into our next speaker, um, Vanessa. Uh, <clears throat> Vanessa is from the San Diego County Planning and Development Services. So Vanessa, Perhaps, uh, you know, again, if you would uh, accomplish two tasks here and put up your contact information so people can reach you and address that concern about um, ADUs and uh, assessed value. Can you guys hear me? So yes, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, so for assessing property value, you would have to contact the assessor's office. Um, and I can, I'll prepare a little slide where we can put up the assessor's contact information as well. But essentially that is taken care of through the county assessor's office. Oh, you're on mute. You can also type it into the chat box and people can see it that way. Oh, uh, got it. I'll do that. Whatever is easiest for you. Okay, perfect. So I will start screen sharing right now. All right, do you guys see the right screen? Perfect. Okay, so uh, yes, I am a planner with the County of San Diego. I will go over some zoning information. And we'll go over some ADU regulations within the unincorporated areas of the County of San Diego. We'll touch on some 8J ADUs, ADUs with a, on a multifamily complex, go over a little snippet of permitting overview and fee waiver and pre-approved plans. So for the County of San Diego, and that's the unincorporated areas of San Diego, uh, the total floor area that's allowed for an attached ADU shall not exceed 50% the floor area of the existing single family dwelling. And that's up to a maximum square foot of 1,200 square feet. So again, you can, you can either build up to 1,200 square feet um, that's the absolute max, and it's 50% of the floor area of the single family dwelling, or you can convert an existing garage or um, an existing area of the house. So a detached ADU, regardless the size of the existing house, is allowed to be up to a maximum of 1,200 square feet. For these setbacks, all ADUs must beat the front and exterior side yard setback, but they are allowed to be as close as four feet from any side or rear yard setback. Um, you know, I 
really urge you guys to reach out to the County of San Diego or to your local um, jurisdiction to find out what is considered your front exterior side or rear setback because it's not necessarily the front facing of your house. Um, so, um, and these are really important setbacks. The front and exterior are, um, must always be met. Um, so one parking space is required for an ADU, except if you can prove that there is public transportation nearby within a half mile. And if establishment of the ADU involves any type of garage conversion, we no longer require uh, replacement parking for that single family dwelling. Uh, for every single family dwelling, it does require two parking spaces, but if you're converting it into an ADU, we do not require that replacement parking. Um, so, and when you are proposing a accessory dwelling unit, um, if it's detached, we do not allow any other room or uses uh, attached to an accessory dwelling unit, except a garage or carport. So a lot of the times we see um, designers, architects come in with plans with detached ADUs with really extravagant barns or storage rooms, and the county will not allow this. So currently we are only allowing detached accessory dwelling units attached to a garage or a carport. Um, and a lot that is proposing an accessory dwelling unit cannot have any type of existing accessory living quarters or guest living quarters or any type of living unit. Um, a detached ADU is limited to 24 feet in height, uh, except for the multifamily complex, and we'll get into that height requirement. Um, separate sale or ownership of an ADU is prohibited, and an ADU shall not be used or rented for less than 30 days. Also, another thing to um, keep in mind when proposing an accessory dwelling unit is always check with any other of the required disciplines. When you're getting a building permit, it will need to get fire approval. So you'll wanna check with your local fire authority, <clears throat> excuse me, to check for any additional setbacks because sometimes the fire authority will have more restrictive setbacks than zoning. So I urge you guys to check with your local fire authority. If it's on septic or a well, you will want to check with Department of Environmental Health to check to see how long I'm sorry, how many bedrooms a, are allowed? Because essentially DEH, Depart Department of Environmental Health, regulates the number of permitted rooms that are allowed. So uh, check, with, uh, check with all your other um, districts just to make sure that there aren't any other regulations that zoning isn't just going to address. Um, so junior ADUs, junior accessory dwelling units are attached to the primary residence. They are not to exceed 500 square feet and it must be contained entirely within the existing single family dwelling. Um, you are allowed to have a junior ADU attached, of course, and then you're allowed to have a detached ADU. We do not allow both ADU and junior ADUs to be attached to the house. Um, and Separate sale or ownership of an AD, of a JADU is also prohibited, and it also shall not be used or rented for less than 30 days. Um, the junior ADUs um, also require a separate entry or exit, so you also have to have the an, uh, the interior connect interior connection to the house, and also make sure that uh, proposed is the separate access. Um, owner occupancy is required for the junior ADU. It's not required for the ADU. And the JADU also needs to include an efficiency kitchen, which is also just a kitchen. Uh, we don't really have any uh, difference in efficiency kitchen versus regular kitchen. And then for the JADU, no additional parking requirements are uh, required for this. And that's a little kind of example here that just shows the interior communication to the rest of the house and also uh, requiring that separate entry. Uh, so for multifamily complexes, uh, we also do allow ADUs on the, um, on, the, on the lot. The thing with the multifamily complex is you are allowed to have um, up to two detached ADUs potentially uh, per lot that has this existing multifamily complex. If you are not, so they do have to meet, um, they're limited to the difference between the multifamily complex ADU height and the regular ADU height 
for some reason, the state says that multifamily complex detached ADUs are only allowed up to a maximum of 16 feet height. Why? I do not know uh, that they, why they're allowing 24 feet on the residential lots and only 16 feet, but that is the state law. So we are kind of mirroring that um, rule. So it is a maximum of 16 feet and also the four foot rear and side yard setbacks. And a non-conforming multifamily complex can have up to the two detached ADUs um, or may have ADUs created within the existing multifamily complex. Um, and just so you know, we consider the multifamily complex two attached units, two or more attached units. Um, and then you can also have ADUs within the complex itself attached, but only structures rooms within the existing multifamily complex um, that are not used as livable space. So that means if you're going to convert a boiler room or a basement or the laundry room, um, you can convert that into an ADU only up to 25% of the existing multifamily dwelling units. Um, so that is for multifamily. And then just a little overview of permitting for the County of San Diego. Um, one thing to always know is know your jurisdiction. We do get a lot of inquiries for city, pro uh, city properties. Um, so feel free to give us a call and figure out what jurisdiction you do belong to because everyone has their own rules regarding ADUs. Um, and then, you know, of course we can help you before you begin. Our counters are open again, 100% open Monday through Friday, eight to 4 p.m. Um, so if you have questions regarding zoning, uh, actual structural questions, um, or questions for Department of Environmental Health, they are here with people that are able to answer questions. Um, and we do expedite plans for accessory dwelling units currently for building plans. Um, and we are also waiving fees, um, but that doesn't include the water sewer school district fees, um, but they are the fees are waived for five years. Um, and yes, so just, yeah, going back to the fee waiver program, it is until January 9th, 2024. Um, and like I said, if you wanted to get information regarding the other fees, you would want to reach out to your local school district, your local water department. I know that some of these fees can really add up. So one thing to look into our all of these additional agency fees that will be applicable when obtaining a building permit for your ADU. Uh, we do have the pre-approved plans that John was um, talking about earlier. Um, we have four size options available, 600 square feet to 1200 square feet with six different floor plans that are available. And like you said, these, these are only 85% complete. So you will still need a plot plan, stormwater plan, energy calcs, trust calcs, um, so again, if you are, if these are something that you're interested in, feel free to come in. You can speak to our structural engineers and, you know, talk to them about, you know, what is, how, how to, to obtain all these other things that are going to require to get a complete set of plans. Um, the plans are available from our website to be downloaded, um, that include, you know, CAD versions. And like he did say, you know, you have to be careful when you're trying to make modifications to the floor plans because it can end up. Uh, changing the engineering on them. But again, you can come in, speak to those engineers and find out what it's going to take. And there, I've heard that, you know, there are some ways to avoid the additional costs uh, when you're changing these floor plans. So just talk to them. You, it might be a window, a door, who knows? You just, I would recommend coming in and speaking to and as many people as you can before you actually pay anybody for a set of plans. And go ahead and you can take a screenshot of this. This is our general ADU email. And then we also have a uh, phone number there available that you can leave messages or send an email regarding ADUs. I'll share this information in the chat as well. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, we do have a handful of questions. Um, I always appreciate that they're answered in a timely fashion rather than being forced to wait to the end. So if um, the panelists don't mind, I'd love to just throw them out there. Um, some of which have we think we've addressed in the chat, but again, let's let's see if we can't tackle them uh, again here. But every, all the panelists, please, when you have a moment, please copy and paste your contact info into the chat. There's been several requests about that. Um, but first question, can you confirm that HOAs aren't allowed to prohibit homeowners from building ADUs? 
That's correct. HOAs are not allowed to prohibit ADUs. Okay. Um, Shirley, uh, I'm not sure if you're around, but there's also been several requests for getting copies of the slides. And I just want to know what the options are for people other than having to screenshot every one. If the instructors would like me to email their presentation out, if they send it to me, I will e email it out to all the attendees. So if you wouldn't mind dropping your um, contact information, Shirley, into the chat, then people can find it and then follow up with you as appropriate to get it emailed to them. Does that sound good? Yeah, Peter? Will do. Yes, sir. Yeah, Peter, I might say, uh, I just uh, answered somebody's question regarding the HOA law. It's, it's actually Assembly Bill 670. It's, it's on the chat. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue on before passing it over to our, our final speaker here mm -hmm. with some of the questions. Um, next one is, what components constitute an efficiency kitchen, an oven, cook, cooktop, etc.? I can answer that. Please go ahead. Okay, basically a, a, a working uh, sink, obviously, hot and cold running water. Uh, a a two-burner stove would be acceptable. Uh, a cooktop will be acceptable. Uh, a microwave, uh, a little refrigerator. Uh, anything that you need to sustain uh, yourself on is, is, they're pretty flexible about those types of things. One thing that you do have to bear in mind though, if you're going to do a JADU, Ventilation is of utmost importance. So you have to vent up through your roof and out uh, through the top uh, if you're doing any type of cooking inside a, a JAD or conversion like that. Okay. Let's see. Does the ADU require to have its own permanent address? As a rule, uh, they, they are. Uh, they, they do an A and a B or a one or a two, or if they have a, a gap between addresses, like a lot of your county properties do, where you may have several numbers, like a 2982, and then you, go, you skip to 2992, then you could go somewhere in between. Vanessa would probably be better able to answer that. You know, I've, if you're putting another meter up uh, in the ADU, SDG&E will ask for a separate address, and usually it's like you said, the A or the B. Cheryl, I saw you um, shaking your head. Do you care to chime in? You're muted. From a, yeah, from a lending perspective, it's important that this is a single family, uh, let's see, zoned single family, not multifamily. And so that has a bearing on it with addresses. A and B isn't a problem. But if, like John said, you're going to have two separate addresses, the post office and the county will be the ones to do that. And that is generally when you have two parcel numbers, um, two lots, then that are, in essence, combined into one. Okay, does that, does that uh, jive with what you with with what you know, of uh, Vanessa? Yes, um, but if there are two parcels, one thing that kind of concerns me is um, make sure that it is a legal lot or make sure that the two parcel numbers are one legal lot. Because if you have two parcels and they're two separate legal lots, you can't have an ADU on one and a single family dwelling on the other. Um, so in the county, making sure that a lot is a considered a legal lot is important if there's multiple assessors parcel numbers because APNs are just through, uh, through um, they're just taxed pieces of property through the assessor's office. So you can essentially have one parcel with 20 APN numbers. Um, so just make sure that it is a legal lot. And if you have multiple um, parcel numbers that it's, uh, you're gonna put a ADU on uh, one legal lot and not on two separate lots, but yes. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple more questions here, and then I'll probably pause to let Cheryl um, give her presentation, but here we go. What does it mean by non-conforming multifamily units? So non-conforming is essentially the same as what most people know as um, grandfathered in. So if it was once at one point, you know, back before current zoning, it was already there established and allowed 
then that's what we consider non-conforming. Um, we don't want to, and I it was probably referring back to the, the multifamily complex is, so uh, sometimes we have these um, lots with two detached single family dwellings. And in that case, we would not allow a ADU because you have already exceeded the allowable density. But if the two dwelling units are attached, we can consider that the multifamily complex. And then that's when we would allow the uh, deta two detached ADUs. Okay. Um, I believe you've addressed this, uh, Vanessa, but one was where can we find the pre-approved plans, the links that was on your last slide, correct? Correct. If you wouldn't well, mind maybe just copying, pasting that link into the chat, that might make it easier for everyone as well. Okay, will do. Um, one more, and then uh, there are more questions, but one more, and then we're going to go to uh, Cheryl. But the last one is, can I change the exterior only? Um, you know, I'm not sure on that. You would need to speak to one, you know, speak to the structural engineers just to be sure I'm, I'm a planner. And so just to be certain, I would prefer somebody to speak to a structural engineer. Okay. Okay, great. So um, to everyone else, I'm not going to ignore your questions. We're certainly going to get to them, but some of them hopefully are going to be covered by our last speaker. Um, and that's uh, Cheryl uh, Sutcliffe. So uh, Cheryl is with uh, Prime Lending and can give us a little insight on uh, ADUs from her perspective. Take it away. Well, thank you so much for inviting me in and I appreciate it. Um, so one of the things to understand is that ADUs are in a wide scale still basically new. And new is not necessarily good where financing is concerned. Uh, so as we have heard, ADUs come in all shapes and sizes, all sorts of different things. The financing options for all these shapes and sizes generally come from Fannie Mae in their renovation loan called HomeStyle, Freddie Mac's Choice Program, we do, Prime Lending has our own uh, construction department and then a home equity line of credit. And that home equity line of credit, also known as a HELOC, is probably the predominant source of income that people use or assets that people will use in order to handle their ADU uh, construction right now. So these are still new to the financing industry, as I said, even though that uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, all allow for stick-built primary residences and an ADU, they're very particular with things like comps on an appraisal. And so if when uh, the appraiser is out there looking at your property to assess for future value. They are going to be looking within the last three months for homes in your neighborhood, and that's dependent on how dense you are. So if you're suburban or urban, the comps are supposed to be within one square mile as the crow flies around your house. If you're suburban, it's within two to five miles. If you are rural, it is five to 20 miles away. That is an appraisal um, normal and customary distance. So the majority of people who are getting ADUs right now are getting them for their own use, not to flip it and make money on it. And so getting comps with ADUs on them is kind of a struggle for appraisers right now because the comps that they have to look at have to be like properties. So single family home with a detached unit, single family home with an attached unit, granny flat, that kind of thing. And they have to have two of the three comps that have the same type of ADU. And so it's a struggle, it just is. And that is part of the problem with us being able to finance the construction of ADUs. 
because unfortunately there isn't a lender out there, Fannie, Freddie, FHA, or VA, that is all excited about unique properties. And unique properties are homes that are not sold normally in the neighborhood. So that's the problem. So we have then um, some additional rules. Let's say you can find recent comps. It has to be zoned for single family, not multifamily. And so like we have already heard the stick built attached, uh, altering the existing property by adding that, that junior ADU or putting a granny flat on a stick built detached, a modular detached, even a manufactured detached. We do have, um, oh, this is a Fannie home style. So Fannie won't allow manufactured homes yet. They're limiting it to modular. Uh, we have traditional 30 year fix, 2015 are available. And what you will do when a time you use the Fannie Mae is within one month of closing, you have PITI payments, principal interest taxes and insurance due. Even though the construction is still underway, you start making that full house payment as if it was done within about 30 days after closing. So the, um, that can be problematic for some people with qualifying and I'm not getting advantage with the ADU yet, but I'm making the payment on it. The Fannie Homestyle Freddie Choice, their rules are uh, up to 95% of after improved value, assuming that the appraiser is gonna give value to the home. Uh, any loan that exceeds 80% of the after imp improved value is gonna require mortgage insurance. And we can go up to the annual county loan limits, which in San Diego County is 753,250. And so we could, I mean, that could be a pretty expensive home. On second or vacation homes, you can go up to 90% county loan limits. You are required to have a minimum of two months principal interest taxes and insurance in reserves after all the closing costs are done. On investment properties, they do allow this, but only as a one unit home with an ADU, you cannot do it like Vanessa showed that side by side, multiple family home with ADUs, there's no financing available out there for that. The maximum time for renovations or improvements is 180 days, which actually right now might be a, put, a stretch. Uh, John might be able to speak to that a little better, but uh, that's only six months and just getting through the permitting process could take a good portion of that. You can combine these renovation loans with other improvements. I had a, a client up in San Luis Obispo who did some repairs to the primary residence and added an ADU, a detached ADU at the same time. And again, the completion timeline is 180 days after closing. Although we are willing to look at extensions, there is a fee for that. For our construction loan, we will go a maximum of 80% of after improved value. That we do allow for interest only payments based on the amount drawn. So at the very beginning, we would pay off any existing liens on the property give the contractor uh, an initial draw to assist with getting things started. And then after that, it's a do the work and then get paid for it straight up until it's done. It is a 12 month balloon and we do, uh, we charge the prime interest rate plus a 1% margin with today's prime being three and a quarter, that's a four and a quarter interest only payment fixed for the life of the loan. You're required to keep insurance and taxes paid on the property. It is not included in that interest only payment. And you can use this either as a purchase or refinance. Now this, I, I'm focused on the ADU part of this, but this is how our construction loan works. 
I am doing a lot of land plus manufactured home primary residence uh, construction loans right now. The home equity line of credit, unfortunately, the um, big banks, all the big banks during COVID shut down their HELOC options. But there are some really great smaller uh, local community banks, as well as uh, credit unions that will still offer home equity line of credit. The big difference here is you cannot use any future value. So if you have a lot of equity in your home and you just need a couple hundred thousand to build that ADU, you may have it sitting right there in the equity. Then you don't need to worry who is in your neighborhood, who's selling homes with ADUs, is this going to appraise? It's based off of just your, your current value of the home without the ADU. Uh, Prime Lending does not offer HELOC options. Ours went away with COVID as well. I, it's short and sweet. There's my information. Take a screenshot of that if you'd like to. And I'm always available for questions for anybody. And that's that. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. Well, we do have some questions for you based on your um, presentation. So um, stand by. Here we go. No problem. Um, let's see, going back to some of the unanswered questions and uh, Vanessa, this one might be up your alley, but it says, how much do the fees add up to that are waived? It really depends because it's by square foot, right? So building permit, the way that we charge our fees for building permits specifically is by square foot. So you know, it's really hard to say. It depends on the size of the house. It depends. There's so many different aspects of a building permit fee, um, but it's definitely a few thousands. So uh, the building permit fee is waived. Um, the parks fee is waived. The transportation impact fee is waived. And so it is in the thousands, but again, there's, there's other fees. So it's, it's still, it's just not the cheapest type of permit still, but it does save you some money. Okay. Let's see here. Another one. I have a listing with an ADU. All fees are paid, park, water, and fire, but it's not built. We have had an appraisal and they gave no value for the ADU with fees paid. Any opinions on that? John, you're muted, you're John. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's going to be a little difficult unless there's something there. Wouldn't you think, Cheryl? I mean... How can you how can you appraise something that, that's non-existent? Yeah, I agree. It's just you have plans, but you're not. Uh, which you've gone through some of the the headache, but what people really want to see is the the end structure. Well, Cheryl Cheryl kind of hit on it uh, in her presentation with with the um, uh, the the pre or the loan. It's, yeah, the, it's called a subject to completion. And it would require a second appraisal once it was completed in order to verify that the value was actually there once it was completed. But also your loan too that you have, uh, the, the construction loan that you provide based on the uh, after installation mm -hmm. value, if you will, mm -hmm. that, that might be another methodology. Right. May, may I ask the individual if he's still on board um, why he hasn't uh, moved forward uh, with the project. I'll let you know if I see a reply pop up. Um, in the meantime, we have several more questions. Can you clarify if a, J a junior ADU needs a separate entry and exit? Or do they require a separate entry from the main residence? They will yeah. both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, someone said they didn't understand. They saw the map of what's an unincorporated city. So an, an incorporated city is one that has its own municipal government, has its own zoning. Um, some areas for the county of San Diego include Ramona, Escondido, uh, Lakeside, 
there are parts of Spring Valley, um, a lot of the more rural areas. And then of course, in the more dense part of the city, it's, it's usually the city of San Diego or there's the city of Vista, La Jolla, Del Mar. They all have their own municipal jurisdiction and their own little city with their own rules and regulations. So that's why it's important to find out which city um, and which jurisdiction you belong to so that you can get the information that is applicable towards for your property. You kind of hit a nerve there, Vanessa. Uh, I'm actually, my home is in, in Vista, but it's in the unincorporated part, unincorporated part of Vista. So we are technically in the county. So that, there are, there, there are some areas of, you know, Vista for one Spring Valley does and there's parts of Spring Valley. Um, there is, so it does, there are some that overlap. But and yeah, you, you also do have, have that, sure. You also have that confusion uh, while we're at it. It doesn't, not relative to county necessarily, but Rancho Bernardo, I believe, is Rancho Bernardo is another city. one where some of them are in the unincorporated areas um, of the county of San Diego. Yes, but also in the city of San. Diego. But also in the city, yes. So that gets confusing. As does <laughs> La Jolla, it does. Del Mar. It does. There's all. It's all over the map. Yeah, um, there is. We ha do have our online website um, and you can type in an address and it'll generate which jurisdiction you belong to. Um, that's also helpful. And that uh, is on the link that you gave us before to your website. That sounds really handy. I will, I put the link for the plans and I will put the County of San Diego link to find your jurisdiction next. Perfect. Perfect. I'm going to bookmark that one myself. Okay, another question. What is the smallest square foot for a junior unit? 150 square feet. Okay, straightforward. Oof, uh, this one's probably, well, let's, let's just dive into it. How long is the time from submittal to permit issuance for ADUs? <laughs> well, That's in the hot seat. Uh, so it depends <laughs> like on, you know, it, a lot of times it depends on who you hire as your architect or engineer. There's so for the good ones, we have one time submittals where they might get small revisions and we might give you a revision and your architect or engineer comes back really quickly with and knows what they're doing and provides a really good set of plans. Um, then, you know, maybe four, four to six weeks, uh, maybe even shorter, four weeks. But then we have engineers and architects that are not experienced with the County of San Diego. And, you know, a lot of times owners rely on these guys to, these people to submit plans. And what will happen is they'll get the corrections, sit on them for like six to eight weeks, maybe longer. I've seen it to where there's months and then resubmit it. And then again, they have a whole list of corrections where they go back and it goes back and forth because of the, you know, the, 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 the kind of plans that they're providing. So a good set of plans, if you hire, you know, somebody who's very experienced, um, it should only take like four weeks. But if you don't have that kind of person, then it just really depends on who you're hiring. I'd like to talk to you, Vanessa, because I, I, I hate to tell you this, but I've been at this for 37 years and I'm still sitting on a couple of projects that I submitted to the county over a year ago that have not been approved. And I've answered all their questions and they've gotten tied up in little things that they shouldn't have gotten tied up in like wooey compliance and all these other things. And we answered all those questions. Uh, we just got a permit yesterday approved that we applied for last February. Yeah. Again, it depends on, you know, it depends on the plans that are coming in. And let me ask you this. Uh, now that the COVID cop out, I mean, the COVID crisis, sorry. Uh, is behind us, we hope. Um, do you think this is going to loosen up uh, a lot of the things that were lagging? I mean, you know, for the last year, we've literally had to go down by appointment. We had to get an appointment just it's to been rough. drop an envelope off. <laughs> it's been really rough with uh, during COVID. You know, I, times were unusually really, really high. Right now with our counters back open, um, we're hoping that we get caught up on all of our backlog. And then when you're able to be face-to-face, -face, it's easier to address any comments that you know the plan checkers have. So I, I do think in the next month or two after we're kind of getting caught up, we, do st we still have a huge backlog. But I think that uh, right now with counters open, it should be able to kind of expedite everything much more quickly. 
Are you kind of a go-to person? Like if we're running into some issues of, with uh, permitting, or would you be a go-to person that we could reach out to? Yeah, you can reach out to me. <laughs> Feet to the I'm cold. Putting on, I'm putting her on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I right. got your I'll phone number. Free. Yeah, I know. Let's uh, let's continue on here. Um, what does stick built mean? Basically, it, it's site built. Is anything you do on site ground up is, is considered stick built? Factory built is anything that you do not on site. Where it's made on, it's made in a factory, uh, yes. manufactured homes. Those are all like pre-built, pre-made. A stick built is something that you would hire a contractor and go out there or yourself to go out there and start building it from the ground up. Correct. Okay. This one is next one is directed um, at Cheryl. Are you saying that if a homeowner does the side-by-side -side ADU, the owner ever decides to sell, even though it's a legal build, it won't be financeable? Ever. I can't predict what's going to happen in the future. Just like last September, September 9th, last year, 2020, Fannie and Freddie just changed the rules. John, how, how long did this take to, to happen? Where they will now start, they have now started to allow financing on a stick built primary residence with a manufactured attached to land as an accessory dwelling unit. And prior to that, there was no financing available at that time. And so those homes had to be sold in cash or hard money. But as of September, 2020, that changed and now it's allowed. So for right now, the rules say multifamily cannot have uh, accessory dwelling units onto them and get financed. But I can't speak down the road. It depends on how soon those become a normal occurrence in the marketplace. And, but until then, that is correct. There is no multiple family financing where an ADU has been placed on the property unless it's considered, um, so let's say this, let's say that you're zoned two family, but you really have three families on that property, right? That's a problem because then that is not legal use. And so it has to stay within legal use. That's the issue. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's see, is there a construction loan for ADUs that is not balloon? Uh, well, I don't, so there are other lenders who will offer construction loans that are not balloon loans. Prime Lending does not have that. However, I can't find another lender who does the straight on, uh, 30 year fix type construction lending. I did some research because we're a tight knit group in this state. And so that if I can't do something but somebody else can, I will refer the, the client, potential client out. And so in preparation to do this, I reached out to all of them and said, can you do ADUs, 30 year fix type thing? And all of them said not on construction, only on the renovation, and then we're limited to non-manufactured. Okay, thank you. Does the county expect to have an occupancy requirement added to ADUs after 2025? Unless the state changes its law that says that it's now required, then you know then we would but other than that i don't see it i don't see it coming to that okay let's see i'm looking at an off-market property with a new two bed one bath adu and it has not been registered as real property yet i'm concerned as to what to do to make sure one it was permitted but also how this will affect lending and what steps to take to have it register, registered as real property and not chattel. Any advice? Chattel, sorry, Cheryl. <laughs> I 
Anyone care to chime in on that one? Do you run that one by me one more time? I think I get it. Yeah, so they have an ADU that hasn't been registered as real property, and they're concerned that once it gets permitted, it's going to uh, affect the lending. What steps do they need to take to have it registered as real property? They so then permit it. It, it, sound, it sounds like it's a manufactured option. Hard to say. Mm. Not, not no. Know. Or unpermitted. Well, Un unpermitted is what it looks like. Unpermitted site built. Uh, I couldn't lend on that. Yeah, it's got to be permitted. Mm -hmm. Now you can get you can get an as built permit. You can you can file for an as built permit, and then basically what happens is the uh, an inspector from the jurisdiction will come out and inspect the property, and they'll write up a list of corrections that you'll have to comply with. Uh, and then have them come back and verify that the corrections have been satisfied and then they can issue a permit re retrospectively. Potentially, because Potentially. Let's, ass let's assume that it's met all of the zoning requirements, all of the structural requirements, Department of Environmental Health, fire and so on. Potentially you could obtain a building permit, but you would still have to prepare plans, go through the entire permitting process and then um, get it inspected and therefore um, be considered, you know, real property. It's a, that's a, a significant amount of our business is doing the uh, unpermitted, non-conforming type compliance retrofits, if you will. Okay, uh, Vanessa, I apologize if you've done so already, but there's another request that you um, post that link to the jurisdiction. Yes. Okay. Uh, next question, do your taxes get reassessed after adding an ADU? That's a yes. <laughs> that is a yes, yeah. To my, to my knowledge, they only reassess the, the value added by the square footage of the improvement. They don't go back and retrospectively reassess the whole house. Yeah, because if someone's been holding on to their home for 15 years, their house may have increased in value and they don't want to open themselves up to that new tax increase. But what you're saying is that tax, the it will be taxed, but just on the ADU, they're not going to look and reassess the primary structure and up. Okay. That's the way the state law is, is, is states it. Perfect. Perfect. It's Thank you. It's so based off of the building permit. Yep. Um, I spoke see. over you, Peter. Sorry. I think we just addressed this. Does any panelist know whether adding an ADU in the city of San Diego will trigger a full reassessment of the property or only add the value of the added ADU? It's the, the latter, based on our discussion, only the value of the added ADU. Okay, I think that is uh, about wraps it up. If anyone has a last minute question, please uh, do so ASAP uh, while we're waiting for that. Just wanted to thank everyone again for not only showing up, but certainly to our panelists for taking the time to be here today. Um, John Aronson of Crest Backyard Homes, Vanessa Pash with the Planning Department and Cheryl Sutcliffe with Prime Lending. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and Thank you, everyone. Let's see. Thank you. So, Enjoyed it. So um, a, a last question or two for Shirley, just people asking where they can find the, uh, the, um, the webinar, the recorded webinar. And I believe you said you were also going to email out later today the, um, the, the slides themselves. That's correct. We will have the webinar posted uh, by tomorrow at the latest. And Great. it will be at www.nsdcrealtorstv.com. Okay. Uh, somebody asked earlier if, if I would share the screen again and with my contact information. I did leave it on the chat line, but I'll be happy to do it if you want me to share my screen again. And they can... Uh, Take a picture of it. Sure, well, I have no problem. Send your presentation, John. I'm sorry. I'll send the presentation out. It'll have your contact information in it. Okay, great. 
So yeah, their presentation should have everyone's contact information. Um, thanks again for uh, North San Diego County Realtors for putting this on, giving me the opportunity to be here. I learned a lot today. Um, and thanks to all of our speakers. Everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.